Welcome to this OncLive News Network presentation, broadcasting live from MJH Studios. Today's discussion will be focused on the latest advances in treating hematologic malignancies with a focus on lymphoma, leukemia, and multiple myeloma. I'm your host, Dr. John Leonard, Professor and Associate Dean at Weill Cornell Medical College and New York Presbyterian Hospital. Today, I'm joined by three of my colleagues who are really leading experts in their fields, and I'll have them introduce themselves. Ola? Thank you for having me, John. I'm Ola Langren. I'm professor of medicine. I'm chief of the myeloma service at Memorial Sloan Kettering. I'm Sasha Pearl. I'm a member of the leukemia program at the Abramson Cancer Center at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm Anas Yunus, chief of lymphoma service at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Well, thank you all for joining us today. I'm really excited about uh, our discussion. Uh, over the next uh, several minutes, we're going to spend some time talking about the data that are going to be presented at the upcoming 2017 American Society of Hematology annual meeting. We're all getting ready to uh, go. We've been looking through the abstracts in advance, and we're going to highlight the most important studies uh, that are focusing on lymphoma, leukemia, and myeloma. And our goal here is really to provide you with perspective on how the data may shape the way that we treat our patients with these diseases. And then in the last few minutes of the broadcast, we're going to answer questions that were submitted from the audience in advance. So we're gonna work through uh, each of our discussants and each of our topic areas. We're gonna first start uh, with lymphoma and Anas Yunus. So Anas, there's a lot happening in uh, Hodgkin lymphoma, which is where we'll kick things off. We have a plenary session talk, a study you've been involved with, a drug you uh, and many others have been involved with, and that's the uh, phase three study looking at upfront brentuximab bedotin as part of ABVD in Hodgkin lymphoma. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, thanks, John. So finally, we got the data, will be presented at uh, the plenary session at ASH, which is a randomized fa phase three trial comparing standard ABVD with the experimental arm, which is brentuximab plus AVD, no bleomycin. More than 1,300 patients randomized. Uh, the uh, primary endpoint is met with about 5% difference in PFS at two years. So it's met the primary endpoint. And then this is a news for us for Hodgkin lymphoma. Mm -hmm. So how do you think this is going to affect your practice uh, seeing patients? Um, clearly, there's a, a progression-free survival benefit. There's not an overall survival benefit in the data we've seen. Uh, there's a little more toxicity, at least in some ways. We have the variable of bleomycin in here now. How do you think the, the field is going to respond? Patients are going to be treated uh, in question. your practice? Yeah, it's a right. very good question. I think it's, uh, it's going to be subjected to a lot of scrutiny based mm -hmm. on subsets uh, and uh, analysis of patients who may have a higher probably uh, benefits uh, compared to others, so who may get benefit more than 5% and others who may not benefit that much. Uh, I think face value, it's a progress regardless how you cut it. Uh, the field's been, uh, uh, been stable for more than four decades, so this is good news that we have something beyond ABVD. We would have liked it to be more positive than 5%, of course, but I think it provides an option to some patients. Mm -hmm. Whether this is going to be blanket treatment, I don't know, but I think it's a good option for some mm -hmm. patients. So what, because uh, this is such an important, potentially practice-changing uh, abstract, what would you say to the audience from the standpoint of looking at the data, what are you going to focus on from the standpoint of taking this back and then the next patient you see having that discussion, what's going to be the key issue? Because I think this is really uh, important for people. Uh, as I said, I think of, we have to wait and yeah. look at the data and in, in, in more details in the subsets mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and then make decisions. There's now embargo on the data that we cannot sure. discuss right now. But I can tell you that there are some subsets that benefited more than, than the average 5%, mm -hmm. and I think this probably would be a good po patient population to be offered this treatment strategy. Great, great. So a couple of the other uh, important abstracts that we wanted to talk around, Hodgkin's also uh, referenced brentuximab vidotin. One of those is by Forniker and colleagues, a European study, looking at, again, the uh, AAVD, essentially uh, plugging in brentuximab vidotin uh, as part of ABVD, swapping in for bleomycin, and looking at a PET-based response after two cycles. So uh, your thoughts on that study? I think it was an interesting design. Yeah, it's an interesting design. It's, uh, so the question is, uh, you know, can we uh, advance uh, brentuximab vidotin to early stage patients? This is more tricky because early stage patients do very well, and so it's mm -hmm. very difficult to find um, improvement beyond the 90, 92% uh, mm -hmm. uh, progression-free survival with standard ABVD or uh, plus-minus radiation therapy. So the endpoint here was a PET2 negative status. 
And there is about 7% difference in PET2 negativity between mm -hmm. the ABVD versus AVD plus printuximab. I think it's too early to call. We need to look at the curves and the long-term follow-up. Not only just the PFS, we need to look if this is going to change the safety profile. I think most people will be interested in the frontline setting, whether the incorporation of brentuximab protein will make you less likely to need radiation therapy. Right. And unfortunately, this trial did not look into the question. Yeah, I think that's a, a key point that this trial, I think they all, all patients had radiation. And so how that figures into the mix if you're leaving out radiation, which many of us obviously do, will be of interest. And then finally, we're now getting into, in Hodgkin's, the kind of novel agents or biologic combinations. And we have Alex Herrera in the group uh, at City of Hope and others presenting data, phase one, two trial in relapsed Hodgkin patients, kind of the pre-transplant population for the most part, looking at brentuximab bedotin, where we've seen a number of different studies trying to use that pre-transplant, in this case with nivolumab. So where do you see that, uh, those data? Yeah, so as, as you will see, and actually there's multiple updates. Mm -hmm. uh, so this abstract's been presented multiple times mm -hmm. in the past. So this is mainly update with more, more patients and more follow-ups. Um, so there's about 60 patients now treated with this combination in a pre-transplant setting. This is the first qualifying salvage before transplant. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at response rate, can we increase the CR rate so patients be be become more qualified for transplant? Mm -hmm. I think it's very interesting because this is a chemo-free regimen, mm -hmm. uh, just two drugs. So you, when you get to transplant, you're probably in better shape, not beaten mm -hmm. up by chemotherapy. 60% CR rate with an about 80% uh, overall response rate is very impressive. As you know, this doublet now has been moved to a randomized trial in the post-transplant setting, which is a, a seeking approval. So now the randomized trial is this doublet, Nevo plus uh, brintuximab compared to the standard uh, brintuximab alone. So it's mm -hmm. an ongoing randomized trial. Right. Great. So now I want to move to mantle cell lymphoma. We have some interesting data. We have a new drug approval in mantle cell lymphoma, which we'll get to in a second. But first, um, there, has been, uh, there have been a couple of studies looking at maintenance for tuximab uh, in various situations in mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, the French group, uh, Laguille, have looked at the idea of maintenance for tuximab after uh, an autotransplant uh, in mantle cell lymphoma. And this was an, extra, an interesting kind of uh, subset analysis where um, most of the patients were treated with RDHAP as their second line therapy, or as I should say as part of their therapy um, before transplant, but a number of the patients for a variety of reasons received oxaliplatin. And it turns out that there were some interesting results in the group that got oxaliplatin seemed to do better, which is not something I, I could say that I would have expected, but uh, your thoughts on this study. Yeah, it's very interesting. So I, I agree with you. Like we, we used to think of platinums are the same. If someone, let's say, fails DHAP, I would not treat them with ice in pre-transplant right. setting. But you know, as from the Corolla studies, there's data to suggest that if you fail ICE, you can salvage them in, with DHAP mm -hmm. about 30%, which is against what everybody would have thought. Mm -hmm. So I think the platinums are, may not be created equal, but this is not just the platinum itself. There's other things with, mm -hmm. these, you know, uh, with these platinum compounds. But yes, it's interesting because they did, not require, they did not specify the type of platinum needed in the salvage regimen. They just mm -hmm. said platinum-based regimen. Mm -hmm. The majority got the DHAB, some got mm -hmm. uh, uh, ICE, and some got the oxaliplatin. Actually, the smallest subgroup received the oxaliplatin. Right. So in the subset analysis, it turned out if you received the oxaliplatin, you did better in terms of PFS and overall survival, right. which is an interesting. Yeah. So I think this is a practice changing. I think even though small numbers, you have to give the patient the benefit of the doubt. And I think most of us would use now oxaliplatin-based regimen in the frontline setting. Great. How Great. would you do, how do you interpret yeah, this? Yeah, I think, I think it's a, as I recall, it was about 35, 40 patients. So it's a small thing. I'd like to study it a little <coughs> bit more, but I think it's, it's certainly a reasonable thing. I mean, there's no, there's no big downside right, I think, exactly to using right. the exactly oxaliplatin right. yes, exactly right. um, in the big picture clinically. So yeah. it's certainly worth considering. Great. Um, so we've now recently had uh, the approval of a calibrutinib, a new BTK or Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitor in mantle cell. And we have a study, really the, the pivotal study being presented and updated um, at the meeting by Michael Wong and colleagues. So your thoughts on this drug and kind of where it fits in mantle cell lymphoma therapy. So that's new data. So mm -hmm. this has not been presented before, mm -hmm. but the drug is approved about right. a month ago. And I, and I think the paper may be already in press somewhere. But it's interesting, about 100-something patients with relapsed mantle cell lymphoma treated with a second-generation BTK inhibitor, which is more selective. So we don't expect it to be more effective because mm -hmm. it binds to the same binding site uh, as ibrutinib. We expect it to be more safe, probably less side effects. So response rate, again, here, is, it's very impressive. It's about, I think, 
had an overall response rate with a 40% CR rate. Now, face value, you could think that, oh, this is more effective than, than Ibrutinib because the CR rate is higher. One need to be careful because they use different response criteria. They mm -hmm. use this, the new modified Lugano criteria, whereas mm -hmm. the old Ibrutinib used the Chesson criteria. If you compare them head to head, they're really not a much of a difference, maybe with a few, mm -hmm. few percentage difference. Great. But certainly it's an interesting a agent that uh, needs to be uh, uh, looked at with the long-term follow-ups. Great, and then finally in Mansell Cell, uh, our group and, and others presented, my colleague Gia Ruan, uh, some longer-term follow-up data on uh, the combination of lenalidomide and rituximab as initial therapy in Mansell cell lymphoma, small study, but a lot of careful follow-up. We demonstrated that there was some MRD negativity and that about 70% of people were still in remission four years later. So interesting, obviously, non-comparative data. And also, I'll ask you, do you think we're reaching a point in mantle cell where we could potentially develop further these non-chemotherapy approaches as initial treatment? I think we are. I think the paradigm would be, as you'll hear from uh, my colleague, Ola, is it's going to be probably following the mantle cell lymphomas. I think we're going to move away from chemotherapy gradually, and we'll use less and less stem cell transplant, I think, up front. Uh, that's my prediction. But it's your, your data is very, very intriguing that you can achieve a, a four-year progression-free survival in about 70%. Overall survival at five years is more than 80%. We used to think the median survival of patients about seven years. Sure. So this is clearly it's an, an option sure. for some patients. Great, great. And then finally, we couldn't uh, leave uh, lymphoma without talking about CAR T cells. We have uh, three different studies, one by Nilapu, one by Abramson, one by Schuster. Uh, three different companies, three different drugs, uh, approvals that are either have happened or that are potentially in the works. Um, and at every meeting, we see more and more about CAR T cells and lymphoma. Your thoughts on kind of what's new at ASH? Obviously, some of these abstracts we're going to see at the meeting because it's not uh, yet public, but what are you going to be looking for? I think it's the reason why we see all these updates because there's a tremendous amount of interest in this data. So people jump into like an updating with, you know, with the, with the short-term follow-ups. But mm -hmm. that, again, that reflects the interest in the field. So you're right. These three uh, abstracts being presented before, this mainly updates. I think the one that I'm looking for is the is Zuma one, which has now the longest follow-up. It's about one year. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to see how many will remain in CR at one year, because this is good benchmark for patients with diffuse lobby lymphoma. The other one is, I think, interesting, but they still have short-term follow-up. Great. And then uh, to move and to finish the lymphoma section of our program with the PRIMA study, Gilles Sal and colleagues presented. Uh, now we have uh, as, as long as 10 years of follow-up with the PRIMA study, which basically looked at rituximab maintenance uh, after chemo rituximab as initial treatment for follicular lymphoma. And longer-term follow-up now suggesting, again, no difference in overall survival, progression-free survival data being presented, toxicity long-term data being presented. How do you think, given that a lot of people in practice, one way or another, either think about using rituximab maintenance and whether or not they actually do, a fair number of patients do uh, receive it, what is your thought as this so, study yeah, helps So, yeah, you have them? to put this in, in, uh, in context. So this is the prima trial compared our chemo versus chemo with, without maintenance rituximab. Right. Clearly, the data is very nice, 10-year follow-up, median progression-free survival is about 10 <clears> years. It's remarkable. But you have to put this in context because there's a parallel trial from Italy, which is a full, I think, uh, five, mm -hmm. which did not use maintenance. With right. ArtShop, with no maintenance, also reported 10-year follow-up and then published in JCO about a month ago with about 10-year progression-free survival. So it's confusing, I think, for, for the average person. My default, I, I would be interested to hear your opinion, for now, I reserve the maintenance for selected patients. My default is not to use maintenance for the majority of patients. Agreed. I, I would say I talk about it with my patients, but in the absence of an overall survival benefit, the patient has a lot of flexibility. Some people really want to push being able to stay in remission. Others say, you know, I'd rather take a break from coming in for therapy. Um, and the good news for patients is that they have a choice, which is certainly nice. So. And then finally, in the last uh, 15 seconds or so, you're presenting some data using an immune checkpoint inhibitor, atezolizumab, with ben, uh, bendamustine and obinutuzumab, one of the first studies with immune checkpoint inhibitors and chemoimmunotherapy. Where do you think that's going? I know it's early, but... Yeah, it is. I think that's what the field is heading right now, to incorporate these new agents that may not have overlapping toxicities with, with frontline regimens. So atezolizumab is a pdl one antibody. The advantage of atezolizumab is I don't, I'm not interested mainly in the concurrent administration with chemo. I'm mainly interested in, in, in the adjuvant or maintenance setting. 
because I think these agents may have a better chance of eradicating minimal residual disease compared to passive immune therapy like an anti-CD20 antibody. Great. So the MRD data, I think one should Great. focus on, not just the overall response. Great. Great. Well, thank you. And we'll uh, come back to some of these topics in the question and answer session in a few minutes. But now it's time to uh, move on to uh, AML and Dr. Sasha Pearl. Uh, again, thank you for being here today. Oh, my pleasure. Jim. And. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I look uh, at AML as a lymphoma doctor, but certainly occasionally hearing about AML patients, there seems to be a lot happening, but I also see in some of the studies we're gonna talk about seven and three hasn't gone away. Yeah, and yeah. people are still working on, on making it better, so we'll get into the details of this. But first, um, a few new agents that I think it seems like people need to know about, and I keep hearing about um, the concept of the IDH inhibitor uh, IDH1 inhibitor and how we take that forward. This is a drug, I ivocidenib, if I'm saying it correctly. Ivocidenib, yeah. Ivocidenib, thank you. Uh, and um, the net is that this is really, it seems like a very important and, and exciting yeah, and, new agent. And, and it falls right on the heels of anacidinib, which is the, the drug from the same company targeting IDH2. Got There's it. two different IDH mutations in AML, IDH1 and IDH2, mm -hmm. that create the same function, but you need different drugs to inhibit the, the, the enzyme itself. Mm -hmm. uh, Anacidinib is the IDH2 uh, inhibitor, and that's actually FDA approved already. Ivocidinib right. is uh, targeting IDH1. And I have to say, if you look at these two in, in separate studies, but very similar patients, they look so similar, it's almost impossible to tell them apart. Um, this, this, like anisidinib, is a drug that they were able to dose escalate from very low doses to very high doses, here from 100 milligrams all the way up to 1,200 milligrams, found no obvious dose limiting toxicities along the way, and picked a kind of medium dose to move forward because they had a biomarker to say they were inhibiting the target of the drug and reducing this, this byproduct of IDH mutation called 2-HG, mm -hmm. and they did that with very low doses of the drug. Uh, they do not see an obvious drug-associated uh, toxicity profile uh, at this dose, uh, but they do see differentiation syndrome with this drug, as they did see with anisidinib. It doesn't happen in a lot of patients. Here they saw it in only 11% of patients, um, but it still does happen. You still need, do need to look for it. Mm -hmm. And like APL differentiation syndrome, patients can get quite sick from this. You need to recognize it, manage it mm -hmm. uh, to prevent that complication. But it looks very promising. Um, and I know that uh, this, this drug is poised to be uh, submitted very soon to the FDA for review based on these data, so this is very exciting. So I, our group has been involved in the studies. I know the Memorial Group clearly has also been very involved in this category of drugs. I've heard about some pretty impressive responses. Mm -hmm. I've also heard of some that were relatively short-lived. Yeah. So it sounds like there's more work to do. Where do you think this is, where this is going? I, I think one of the exciting and interesting things about AML and one of the hard things about it is that it's a really heterogeneous disease. Mm -hmm. And one mutation means you have a target, but it doesn't mean that if you use the same drug, it will always get you the same response. Mm -hmm. And that's because these mutations fall in a background of multiple mutations. And mm -hmm. I think it's really that combination, mm -hmm. which opens up the door for, can we target more than one mutation with more than one drug? And I think that's mm -hmm. the next thing that we're Great. gonna do in the field. Great, okay. So the next study uh, is by Wei and colleagues that we wanted to touch on, and this is a study that took patients, uh, older patients with AML, uh, and uses as a backbone uh, uh, the uh, lower dose uh, ERA-C uh, approach that people I think have been using for a while, but now adding in venetoclax, a BCL2 inhibitor to this approach. And I think the, the data were, were fairly interesting. Yeah. What are your thoughts on this trial? So there are, there are actually a, a few studies of venetoclax added to low intensity chemotherapy. This one looks at low dose ERA -C. And last year there were presentations of uh, venetoclax with hypomethylating agents. And the data again are very similar. Mm -hmm. It looks like the addition of venetoclax to that background of low intensity chemotherapy dramatically increases the response rate. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about this abstract is not really the response rate, which you can do by adding more agents to low dose RSC, but the durability of the responses, which I think is much more important. Mm -hmm. um, there have been many drugs added to low dose RSC that have mm -hmm. had better response rates, but no improvement in survival. We can think of clofarabine, we can think of volacertib, mm -hmm. we can think of uh, gemtuzumab, ogosomycin. Um, and none of those drugs won out in, in phase three comparisons. This looks very promising because the one-year survivals actually look very, very good. Um, 
the median survival on this study is about 11 months. Um, mm -hmm. I believe 46 percent of patients were alive at a year, and those numbers look about twice as good as you, what you'd expect for low-dose RSC alone. Mm -hmm. So where where do you think this is going to fit in relative to the hypomethylating agents, which yeah. seem to yeah. also be I, used in this group of patients? I think the, the hard thing is, you know, many of these patients who get to AML have already seen a hypomethylating right. agent mm -hmm. for their MDS and then develop AML. What's notable here is a significant proportion of these patients that had prior hypomethylating agents and still responded, which is hard to do with seven mm -hmm. and three. Mm -hmm. and so that's actually quite interesting. And, and some people have even posed the question of, you know, should we be testing regimens like this against uh, a comparator arm of seven and three rather than a comparative arm of Lotus RSC, which I'm not sure we're quite ready for, but I think that is potentially a question we could move towards. Great. Okay. So there are a number of drugs now we'll, we'll move towards that are targeted drugs that are looking at uh, FLT3 uh, in inhibitors or FLT3 inhibitors and targeting <coughs> FLT3 mutations of one form or another. And I want to look at my notes so I get the names right because they're not on the tip of my tongue, under, other, unlike brentuximab. Um, so giltritinib. Yes, and, and, and feel free right to correct off, me right if right I get, time, get it wrong because I'm sure I will yeah. if I haven't already. So this was a study looking at, at, at this uh, as, as I understand it, FLT3 inhibitor mm -hmm. primarily uh, in patients with newly diagnosed AML in combination with chemotherapy. Right, and, yeah. and the background on this is, as we know, a couple of years ago at ASH, one of the plenary abstracts was the Ratify study where mitostorin, a very uh, broadly selective kinase inhibitor that happens to inhibit FLT3, was added to standard frontline therapy and improved the survival uh, relative to placebo. So 7 and 3 plus mitostorin in FLT3 mutated patients improved survival and now is the standard of care. So the real question is if those non-selective drugs can do that, what about a, a selective and potentially more potent drug? And mm -hmm. so there's two drugs that are, are being looked at in this setting mm -hmm. this year at ASH. Um, this study uses gilteritinib, um, which is a very selective and highly potent drug mm -hmm. um, that has substantial single agent activity in relapsed refractory patients added to 7 and 3 therapy. And this is the first time that data with that drug have been presented in a combination regimen. And it, as you can see, uh, we're still working out the optimal dosing, but it seems like we can go up to the same doses that were active in uh, single agent therapy, mm -hmm. uh, which seems to be quite uh, tolerable, and also the response rates are really quite high. Um, there's not enough following up on this study to really say how well uh, this is working in the long run, but there, you know, there are median uh, survivals of about a year on this study uh, for the FLT3 mutated patients who were mm -hmm. treated. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, the response rate was more than 90%. And roughly, again, what percent of AML patients are FLT3 mutated? So about a third mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. Maybe a quarter of them will right. have a FLT3 ITD, which is the really more sinister right. of the two mutations. Right. Um, and maybe 5 or 10% will have a FLT3 uh, point mutation in the tyrosine kinase domain, um, which has less of a risk of relapse. But if either of these <coughs> relapse, the disease is very aggressive and survival sure. short. Sure. Okay. And then the other one we, we referenced was uh, crinolin crinolinib. Yeah. So crinolinib right? is in many ways very similar to gilteritinib. Right. Uh, these drugs were both developed because they were potent, selective, and also they went after uh, resistance mutations that have emerged with other FLT3 inhibitors. So both of those are, are kind of tick those boxes off. They differ a little in pharmacokinetics. Uh, gilteritinib is a long-lived drug. It has a half-life of several days. Uh, Crinolinib has a half-life of several hours, so we don't know the right answer here. Do you want a short-lived drug so it's easier to combine with chemotherapy if you run into toxicity issues, it gets out of the water very quickly, or do you want a long-lived drug because you can get more continuous inhibition of target? I, I think we'll find this out right. over time. The data from this study were presented a year ago, and what you're seeing again here is longer follow-up. Uh, so we don't have a lot more information about response rates, but again, response rates are very high in frontline therapy. The big problem in, in particularly FLT3 ITD mutated AML is relapse. Mm -hmm. And what's encouraging from these data is the relapse rate was really quite low. There were only two relapses amongst, I believe, 24 patients in remission on this study, which is uh, substantially lower than one, what one might expect from this population. Mm -hmm. If we look back historically, uh, FLT3 ITD positive patients in first CR can have as high as a 70% relapse rate in the first two years. Now, the median follow-up here is not that long, mm -hmm. but this is very encouraging even for, uh, for early data. Great. And there is a randomized study looking at crinolinib added to frontline therapy compared to mitostorin added to frontline therapy that's just about to activate. So we'll see whether the data from Ratify uh, really will be improved by a newer drug.
And, and do we have any data in these drugs? And I know probably single agent activity is pretty modest, but if you get one drug and then you progress, is there any activity with the other? Is yeah, so um, patients who have progressed uh, with, with frontline therapy with these agents have been salvaged with, with the mm -hmm. other. So the patients who got mitostorin in frontline therapy and then wound up on either canolinib or gilteritinib have responded. That's been true of other FLT3 inhibitors, serafinib, quizartinib, um, have been salvaged with uh, gilteritinib or uh, canolinib. Interesting, great. Well, it's good to see progress there. It seems like once you have one, like in so many other areas, once you have one successful drug with the might of story, the door to kind of then everybody you're, else yeah, is going yeah. there, and then it's how can we, uh, um, you know, kind of carve out other areas, make it a little better, et cetera. Yeah. But it's over and over that seems to happen, which I think is good, because ultimately we'll have more options and the toxicity profiles, no doubt, are different, et cetera. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, okay, and then we're gonna now move to uh, a, a category of drug that is similar to uh, some that we see in other other uh, lymphoid or, or myeloid malignancies and and some that are not. This is flotituzumab. Um, it's a MAB, so I can say it better. <laughs> uh, and this is, uh, however, not quite a MAB, or I guess it is a, a DART protein, which uh, is a version of a, a bispecific sort of molecule targeting on the one hand CD23, and on the other hand, CD3, again, yeah. to engage T cells and bring them in and presumably have an anti-leukemic effect there. So what are your thoughts on this study? Um, I, th I think we're all excited to use immunotherapy for AML and given the experience with immunotherapy and ALL, uh, everybody says this is, you know, hopefully something we can just move from one disease to another because look at how well it works there. And, and that's the promise. The challenge is actually the execution. Um, because one of the hard things in AML is it's very hard to get a, it's, it's relatively easy to get a lymphoid selective antigen you can go after with an antibody or a CAR T cell. Um, it's much harder to do that in AML because so many of these antigens are expressed on normal cells in hematopoiesis. Mm -hmm. So CD123, which is what's targeted by uh, flotituzumab here, um, is expressed on hematopoietic stem cells and early progenitors. Um, it's expressed in other tissues, including uh, vascular endothelium. Um, so there is the potential for these drugs to create toxicity. And that has been an issue with drugs that were developed to target CD123 with FDA holds on a few of these agents. Mm -hmm. um, and some developments actually canceled because of toxicity. What's notable for that reason is that this seems to be more successful. Mm -hmm. They actually have been able to give this drug. Um, this is a, a, a phase one study where uh, flotituzumab, which again is a bispecific uh, CD123 and CD3, uh, recognizing dual affinity retargeting molecule, that's the DART. Mm -hmm. Um, was able to be given um, uh, by, by infusion to uh, 45 patients in a dose escalation study. Um, and they did see cytokine release syndrome in the mm -hmm. study. Um, they did also see responses. Um, so they basically look like they found a manageable way to give immunotherapy with a single agent here for relapsed refractory patients. And I think that's very encouraging. Mm -hmm. It's a small study you know, in terms of looking at what the optimal dose is. And I think the follow-up is still limited, but, but this is encouraging. And again, this is not the only drug in this realm. There, mm -hmm. there are many other companies that are developing drugs to look at this. Um, there are many other targets that could be looked at, whether it's CD123, CD33, CLL1, CD47, the checkpoint inhibitors. There's mm -hmm. many different ways we could look at this uh, in terms of how do we get immunotherapy to work for AML. I don't think anybody knows the right answer, but it's encouraging to see some early successes in terms of a feasible regimens, and then we can figure out what works the best. So is your sense that these are ultimately going to be developed, and obviously there, there will be patient subsets that are at least hypothesized to be more or less relevant, but is your sense that these will ultimately be kind of built on the seven and three or the low dose RSC? Are yeah. they gonna be things that are bridged, bridges the transplant? Uh, you know, if you had to look in your crystal ball for this kind of category of drugs. Well, I, I think the hard thing here is just, you, you gotta do what works in the relapse refractory setting to at least show you have activity and safety because that's where you can develop drugs. But once mm -hmm. you see something that works, you wanna move it as early as possible. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, knowing that allo transplant works in first remission better than after relapse, anything mm -hmm. that's immune based, we're gonna wanna move early on. Mm -hmm. uh, is this going to replace chemotherapy? I think that's a bit of a stretch, but mm -hmm. can we find ways that we can reduce the toxicities of chemotherapy? That's what's very encouraging about many of these new drugs, mm -hmm. whether it's adding venetoclax yeah. to low intensity chemotherapy or oral outpatient agents like ivocidinib or, or perhaps a FLT3 inhibitor. Um, just finding ways to make therapy easier is important because it's currently very toxic. Right. So you referenced uh, allo transplant, and we have some data on older patients uh, getting uh, non-myeloablative allo transplant. Uh, and, and kind of where is that fitting in things? It's amazing, uh, you know, how 
how the uh, age range has gone up and how the options have, have come up for, for older patients at various, uh, various points of the course of their disease, whether it's MDS or AML. Um, what do these latest data tell us? If, is there something helpful there? I, I think what, what these data tell us, first off, is that standard therapy has actually gotten better over the years, and mm -hmm. allotransplant has gotten better, but who benefits has been a question over the age of 60. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of data on how to use cytogenetics or even molecular prognostication mm -hmm. under the age of 60, mm -hmm. but a lot less to go on in terms of how do we use diagnostic tests, mm -hmm. tests that we now all have mm -hmm. to guide our therapy for older patients, who are the majority of the patients that we treat. And while we can give transplants to patients, not without regard to age, but to more and more and more patients, and fairly easily up to the age of 70 or so, mm -hmm. um, how well does that work? Mm -hmm. um, and I think what this study shows uh, from the, the Alpha Group um, uh, by uh, Gardin and colleagues mm -hmm. is, is, is basically that the major benefit in older patients still is restricted to the most high-risk patients mm -hmm. um, by either molecular or uh, karyotypic prognostication. Here they use the ELN classification, which has been validated across the age gamut, um, but, but it, it, in order to say how well could it actually predict who benefited from transplant, they saw the majority of benefit, and really the, the most sizable benefit was seen in the ELN adverse group with mm -hmm. not an obvious benefit for transplant in other patients, mm -hmm. um, which I think is a little bit eye-opening, but I don't know that this is really a definitive answer. I think this is a start to likely more and more groups reporting their experience with this. Um, we have those data for younger patients, and we have less complete database in older patients. Great. All right. Well, again, we'll come back to some of these issues in a few minutes. Uh, now time to shift gears over to multiple myeloma. And Ola, it's great to have you here and your, uh, your perspectives on a number of the different abstracts that are going to be presented. Um, one of the things that we wanted to start with was, was the concept of smoldering myeloma and the high-risk smoldering myeloma. We were talking before the discussion about the fact that some of this is semantics as to where you draw the line um, and the parallels between uh, other lymphoid malignancies and, and kind of the the early disease or early stage versus later stage. And the, the concept of smoldering myeloma seems to be more and more important for people in practice to understand. So before we get to these abstracts, just a, mi a minute or so on kind of what, what is smoldering myeloma and, and what are the key points as one thinks about it? Well, I think you really focus on a very important area. I see this mm -hmm. a lot in my practice. I get a lot of referrals and a lot of private practice doctors don't really know, is this myeloma with a new criteria? Because right. the new myeloma criteria were updated just two years ago. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be sick to be right. called myeloma. That could be biomarkers. Right. So I think the long story short is that smoldering myeloma has certain criteria. You are not supposed to have any of the uh, end organ damage with mm -hmm. renal failure, anemia, bone lesions, and those types of things. And also there are three other biomarkers. There are the light chains being over certain thresholds, high mm -hmm. plasma cell infiltration in the marrow, mm -hmm. and or uh, MRI changes in the mm -hmm. bone marrow. Okay. If you don't have that, you could now fit still with a smaller ring category. I think it's important here to say that at this point, there is still no FDA approved drug for patients who do fulfill the criteria right. for smoldering myeloma. Uh -huh. So if you have more than 10% plasma cells and or if you have an M-spike greater than three grams per deciliter, in mm -hmm. the absence of these myeloma mm -hmm. uh, factors, you have smoldering myeloma. Mm -hmm. And you should not treat this patient outside of clinical trial. That's important. Mm -hmm. But I think the field is changing. Mm -hmm. And that's what ASH is really yeah. kind of shedding a lot of light yeah. on. Yeah, so there are a number of very interesting studies. I think uh, we're just going to hit a couple of them, but one was a study from Matios, which uh, to me is kind of in some ways very aggressive, in the other hand, some ways smart, in that this is like throwing the kitchen sink almost to a smoldering myeloma patient, and you can say, well, wow, that's overkill, or you could say, well, maybe you're going to cure patients with this. So what's your take on this study, and tell us a little about it. Yeah, so the Mateus study is a kind of a follow-up on two other studies that have been done in the past few years. In mm -hmm. 2012, this same group from Spain, Mateus, they published in the New England Journal a randomized study between lenalidomide dex versus observation. There were 60 patients in each of the two arms. Mm -hmm. And they found that that was associated with about the both progression-free and overall survival. Mm -hmm. So as a follow-up on that, we led a study when I was at the NCI mm -hmm. where we added carfilzomib to rabelumid dexamethasone in a single-arm study. Mm -hmm. And we showed in that study that you could have 100% complete response rate, mm -hmm. and there were 95 or so percent MRD rates. Mm -hmm. So it would make sense to see, could you expand on that? And that's right. exactly what this study is about. So mm -hmm. they enrolled 90 patients across Sp uh, Spain mm -hmm. in a multi-center fashion. And they treated them with the same therapy we used at the NCI, but they also added transplant. Mm -hmm. uh, 
at this time when they present at ASH, this is the first presentation from the study, uh -huh. they only have a few patients who have completed all the therapy. Mm -hmm. And so far the numbers look very similar to the NCI study, but I think the key question will be long term, right. will there be a big difference if you add a transplant or not in terms right. of efficacy? And, mm -hmm. and it's too early. But I think this study is going to be important. It will mm -hmm. answer an important question. So you use your most aggressive treatment up front? Right. We don't know. Right. So do you think ultimately we'll end up answering this question by some sort of big randomized trial of kind of not much therapy or no therapy versus this more aggressive therapy? Do you think we're... Myeloma groups seem to have done those sorts of trials much better than we have, I'd say, in lymphoma. Mm -hmm. So, so there is yeah. actually already a study mm -hmm. coming very soon using mm -hmm. the same uh, regimen that was done at the NCI with mm -hmm. the KOD without the transplant in right. a randomized study mm -hmm. versus ravlumid and mm -hmm. that's going through the European Myeloma Network uh -huh. and are also participating sites. We are mm -hmm. opening it at uh -huh. Memorial as well. Uh -huh. Good. Okay, great. So then the other drug that uh, obviously is well known to the audience uh, in, in more standard myeloma is now getting a look in the smoldering myeloma, daratumumab, the antibody-based therapy. So your thoughts on this trial from Hopmeister and colleagues? So this is another study for smoldering myeloma. All of a sudden there are now all these trials going for smoldering <laughs> myeloma. So it's a randomized I didn't even know there was smoldering myeloma years ago. Now it's uh, more <laughs> common than myeloma. The myeloma like. field is changing <laughs> so rapidly. Every six yeah. months there is new data. That there will be five new drugs in the coming right. five years, I do think. There will right. be so much new coming. So this trial by Hofmeister is a randomized phase two trial with uh, 123 patients. There are 41 mm -hmm. patients in each arm. So the one arm has only eight weekly doses of daratumumab, mm -hmm. uh, the CD38 monoclonal naked antibody. Mm -hmm. uh, the other two arms go up to a total of three years, mm -hmm. and they are different in terms of the intensity of the dosing. Mm -hmm. And the study has uh, two cool primary endpoints. Uh, one endpoint is complete response rate at six months, and the other one is progression-free survival at 12 months. Mm -hmm. And according to the abstract, there is a progression-free survival difference already at 12 months of follow-up in this patient population. Mm -hmm. So here you have it, John. Yeah. Maybe we should start mm -hmm. thinking about early treatment. Mm -hmm. Great, great. <laughs> okay. Well, and then that leads us obviously to biomarkers because like, like in every malignancy, but particularly when you have some heterogeneity in the clinical outcomes and trying to choose therapy, and we have Bustoros and colleagues, and I know this has been an area that just like in leukemia, just like in lymphoma, the molecular profiling, of one sort or another to try to predict who's going to do better and worse and, and treatment. Uh, insights on that from this, this report. I think this is, a, this is an interesting study. It's from the group up in Boston. They have taken close to 200 patients and they have mm -hmm. conducted whole exome sequencing and they have done whole genome sequencing on a subset of these patients, deep whole genome sequencing. And really the idea they have is to see whether you actually genetically can predict who is going to go into multiple myeloma. Mm -hmm. There is no study that so far really has done that in mm -hmm. full resolution. And I mm -hmm. think this study doesn't fully answer, but it provides a lot of new clues. So it shows, for example, that the mutational burden is higher in what we clinically refer to as high-risk smoldering myeloma. Makes sense. They look at the number of mutations per megabase pair, and mm -hmm. it's 1.4. And if you look at studies that look at multiple myeloma, it's 1.6. And then they look at the low risk smoldering myeloma. And in that group, it's around 0 0.7. So it's almost a doubling. They mm -hmm. also look at mutations, somatic mutations in pathways that are known to be important in myeloma. And there are striking significant differences. Uh, and they do different types of analysis. And they show there are differences. Mm -hmm. What they do not show here, at least in the abstract, is really how the mechanisms work and if this is something that could be used for, for treatment. Could you use this as target? So there's more work to be done, but it's, it's very exciting. Great. So, so to reiterate then, as we move from smoldering, then it sounds like outside of a trial, really not standard to treat patients at this point? Yes, that is absolutely right. Great. But uh, certainly it sounds like well, that may change before too long. I think uh, so. Yeah. Excellent. Great. So from the standpoint of newly diagnosed patients, uh, the audience knows that transplant is, uh, is clearly an important part of myeloma therapy. And uh, you know, data on that are looking at uh, the IFM, I know, has some new sta studies on, uh, on uh, really minimal residual disease and, in, and using that as a, uh, as a tool in the treatment of patients with myeloma. What are your thoughts on that study? Yeah, so this is an update. Uh, it's presented by uh, Hervé avel from the mm -hmm. French uh, group. And they mm -hmm. have done very important work for very many years. And this is mm -hmm. just another great study they have done. They actually mm -hmm. published the 
first paper on the same population just a few months ago mm -hmm. in the New England Journal of Medicine. Mm -hmm. And this study was designed to look at the combination of bortezomib, willanalidomide, and dexamethasone after three cycles, transplant, two more cycles, and maintenance, mm -hmm. versus giving three cycles, collect the cells and keep them in the freezer, mm -hmm. and do five more cycles of the same therapy, and then maintenance. Mm -hmm. So they were looking at the use of transplant upfront versus keeping it and use it as rescue. Right. And the primary endpoint in that study was to look to see three years out, is there a difference in progression-free survival? And mm -hmm. the answer is yes, and the mm -hmm. winner was transplant. Mm -hmm. So when this was initially presented at ASH, I think that half people who listened to it heard that transplant won, right. although that was the winner. Mm -hmm. The people who heard that transplant lost were the people who went to the second presentation by the <laughs> same group. Because what they had done was that they stratified the data by response in the two arms. And they had preliminary data at the time showing that MRD negativity was achieved in both arms. More people in the transplant arm than in the other arm. But if you were MRD negative, that was the very similar progression for survival. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what this a new abstract is looking at. And now they have kind of taken it to the new level. They have used sequencing based data, not only flow cytometry data. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this abstract is important it really kind of pushes the field even more in the direction of what Anas was talking about before. What's going to be the role for just throwing chemotherapy on every patient mm -hmm. in the future? Is that right. really where we are going to go? Right. Or can we use markers to determine the use of that? So right. I don't pretend to know the answer to it, but right. I think the data here is very provocative and it suggests that maybe transplant could be given in patients where there is still detectable disease. And that's what they suggest in their abstract. Great. And then uh, just two quick uh, other points about uh, transplant. There were two, two other studies, one on secondary malignancies and one talking about uh, lenalidomide maintenance in both in transplant and non-transplant settings. Just the quick takeaways from that. Yes, yeah, so the second uh, paper, or the first of those two you mentioned there, the second malignancy paper, this is a large database that looks into patients in California. There mm -hmm. were close to 19 or 16,000 patients. Mm -hmm. And they found 900 of them to develop a secondary malignancy. And that was recognized many years ago in myeloma that there is an overrisk for malignancy, in particular hematologic malignancies. Mm -hmm. And the papers that came out in the 70s, they were accusing alkylators. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, for a while, people forgot about it and the therapies were not that good. And then mm -hmm. when lenalidomide maintenance came into practice around the 2010 or so, people started looking into it again and there was signal. So this study looks into patients treated with and without a transplant upfront. Mm -hmm. And they look at five and 10 years of cumulative incidence of secondary mm -hmm. malignancy. Mm -hmm. And they show in this study that at five and 10 years of follow-up, the cumulative uh, incidence of secondary malignancies are four versus 7% in the non versus the transplanted patients. You double basically the rate of secondary malignancy uh, in, the, in these uh, patients. Uh, and they show that th the particular increase is in the patients uh, that uh, are, are transplanted with regard to hematologic malignancy. Mm -hmm. So they say maybe that's another reason for thinking about other therapies. Mm -hmm. Great. So then, uh, obviously, there are a lot of new drugs in myeloma. We've had recent approvals, or relatively recent. I guess they're getting a little older now because we have much more experience with these drugs. But a couple of randomized trials that have looked in relapse patients with lenalidomide, dexamethasone, and either carfilzomib in a study led by Keith Stewart or using daratumumab, uh, in, a, in a study led by Demopolis. So again, these kind of two drug versus three drug combinations. Your take on these? I think these are two very important clinical papers. Mm -hmm. uh, they are updates on existing data, but they are very important because mm -hmm. they're large randomized studies. So mm -hmm. the first, uh, the Stewart study, mm -hmm. that's the ASPIRE trial. Mm -hmm that uses cofilzomib rablamidaxamethasone versus rablamidaxamethasone. And this update at this ASH is showing that the overall survival is significantly better mm -hmm. in the three drug combination. Mm -hmm. Previously, it was only for progression-free survival. Now they show that the hazard ratio is 0.79. Mm -hmm. It's a 21% reduced risk of, of, of death. And the median uh, progression, uh, overall survival, the median mm -hmm. overall survival is 48 versus 40 months. Mm -hmm. So that's very important. I think for the daratumumab study, that's also very important. That's an update on the POLYX trial mm -hmm. uh, that uses daratumumab rablamid dexamethasone versus, again, the same rablamid uh, dexamethasone. They do not have overall survival data, mm -hmm. but they have an extended follow-up. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the follow-up time goes this time up to 33 months. Mm -hmm. uh, in the paper that also comes from the New England Journal, I think myeloma 
uh, bought probably many pages in the New England Journal the uh -huh. past uh, few years here. There have been so many papers. That previously was 18 months, now it's 33 months. And it holds up and none of the two arms have yet met uh, the, the median for progression-free survival. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also a very interesting uh, combination for sure. So then uh, I couldn't, uh, we couldn't end a discussion on lymphoid malignancies without talking about CAR T cells. Mm -hmm. And uh, I you know, have not followed the myeloma CAR T cell area quite as closely, but I, you know, coming in and looking through the abstracts just at a high level, it seems like there's a lot of uh, uh, great data coming along, very exciting data, although admittedly early. Uh, Burdeja and colleagues presented some data on the BCMA as a target antigen. Uh, and, uh, and, and some clinical activity. Your thoughts on these data and where that will go? Yeah, so Badea is presenting on the BB2121 uh, mm -hmm. CAR T cell. That is a BCMA targeted CAR T cell uh, mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. And they show in, uh, in uh, those uh, cohorts about 50 million cells of these CAR T cells that you, mm -hmm. you have patients who reach even complete responses. Mm -hmm. uh, Similar to what we heard from the other disease areas, the numbers are relatively small, the follow-up time is restricted. There is mm -hmm. another presentation by, uh, by the UPenn group, mm -hmm. by Adam Cohn. There mm -hmm. is a presentation uh, by the Sloan Kettering group also with Eric Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there will be others also. There in fact are five ongoing clinical trials using different CAR T cells targeting BCMA in myeloma this time. Mm -hmm. So they all show very similar uh, findings that the therapy seems to work if you go in higher doses, mm -hmm. uh, you run into uh, cytokine release syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, the BB2121 has less of that uh, reportedly, but numbers are small. There are some patients that have been followed for up to a year that persist in CR, mm -hmm. but numbers are small, so it's early. It's mm -hmm. exciting, but we need to see more data. Great. So uh, thank you, that's been a great overview and I think we wanna make sure that we allow time for questions and I think um, it's funny because we got a number of questions uh, in advance from people and I think that you all in your discussions have really hit them which is what I, th I think it really shows the audience is on the mark about what people are thinking about and asking about. And, and I, at the very end, uh, before we wrap up, I'm gonna ask each of you to give me your thoughts on uh, where, uh, what, what exciting things uh, are coming forward that we haven't talked about in each of your areas. But I first wanna um, just, we had a question on MRD testing and I think I'm gonna ask each of you actually, I'll start with an us so uh, everyone can kind of catch their breath. Um, but where is, in, in each of the respective areas we've talked about, where is MRD testing um, going? And first in lymphoma. I think for lymphoma, that, uh, there's two questions that need to be answered. One, can uh, liquid biopsies or MRD testing, whatever you want to call it, predict uh, uh, clinical risk relapses uh, so you can save the patient the multiple imaging studies throughout their life span, and especially the chronic diseases where you have multiple relapses in a lifetime, like a follicular lymphomas and, and also in, a, in, a, in mantle cell lymphomas. The second question, especially if you're shooting for cure, improving the outcome, and if you detect MRD or, or, or circulating tumor DNA, is it actionable? And if it is, you know, how, do you, how do you design treatment based on that? Great. So, so I, I think in, in leukemias, we have a long history of using MRD to, to drive our therapy. In CML, we've been doing that for years, looking at BCR able levels. Um, in ALL, uh, we have a lot of experience with flow-based MRD, um, and that's actually taking over as the primary way we're gauging response, particularly in younger patients, um, and making therapeutic decisions based upon that. It's much harder to do this in AML. Uh, to do flow-based uh, MRD for AML is technically very challenging. There's a limited number of places that really feel confident enough to give you a report at all, and inter uh, center variability is quite significant. So a lot mm -hmm. of in the field are moving towards, can we use a, a mutation-based mm -hmm. assay? And then the question is, what do you go after? Mm -hmm. um, there's actually an interesting uh, late-breaking abstract on this topic looking at following uh, next-gen sequencing on multiple time points to see uh, do you clear mutations and do you clear all the mutations or some mutations? And that actually may emerge as an important way to say, are you getting a deep enough uh, treatment response? We're, we're really not quite ready to use MRD to say we have the right answer for every patient, but for certain subsets, particularly nucleophosma mutated patients, the data really are there that is, is a way that we can follow patients. And the big question that we have is if you change therapy, does it change outcome? Okay. Hola. In myeloma, it's already in the clinical uh, criteria for mm -hmm. response evaluation for clinical trials. Mm -hmm. It came out last year in the, uh, the most updated revision. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I think the field is moving from old flow cytometry assays into mm -hmm. uh, VGJ-based uh, sequencing. Mm -hmm. It has at least 10 times higher sensitivity, it's much more reproducible. And the data, I mentioned some of the French data, mm -hmm. suggests that that's where you start seeing the plateau in terms of progression-free survival. So mm -hmm. I think it's going to be very important to move into the direction of that. I do foresee that we could have drugs approved in multiple myeloma based on MRD as a surrogate endpoint. Because yeah. the data from two meta-analyses shows yeah. that there is a very strong correlation with progression-free survival. More work to be done, but that's gonna happen. Yeah, great. So we had a question uh, that came in from, from uh, the audience and around uh, brentuximab and, and AV, AVD, that combination. I think you, you uh, addressed it in your discussion, but maybe in a, in a broader sense. I mean, we have the potential now to use it up front, to use it in the relapse pre-transplant setting, post-transplant setting. Where do you think that's all gonna settle out? Is it gonna be everywhere? Is it gonna be here, there? Um, how is that all gonna play out? Considering we're gonna have studies that to some degree are positive at the back end or positive at the front end, and wouldn't surprise me if somewhere in the middle it's positive. You know, how do we settle all that out? I don't think these patients are gonna be on this drug for indefinitely, and clearly a lot of people don't need it because the vast majority of people are cured without brentuximab. So where do you think we're going now? So that's what happens when you have a, a single agent that gives you a 75% response rate mm -hmm. in multiple uh, uh, setting that will be moved and combined in, in a front line, in pre transplant and post transplant that's what we're seeing. So I'm not surprised about that. The question is, is it gonna benefit everyone? I don't think it will benefit ev uh, everyone. And that's gonna come down to biomarkers and subset analysis. So we need to look at the subsets who benefited the least when they randomized trial and not offer them this drug, and, and the subset who benefit the most and then we offer them this drug. Okay. So um, AML seems to be getting more and more complicated. I, uh, and and we're, we're moving from cytogenetics to molecular markers and now targeted drugs. Kind of when you're seeing a new, newly diagnosed AML patient, um, how do you uh, kind of tackle that? I know you, that you're setting off a lot of these studies, but what do people in practice need to know about and where do you think the future is that are really actionable today? I mean, I think the, the basic question of is this patient fit for intensive therapy mm -hmm. or are they unfit for intensive therapy remains. Mm -hmm. I think we have appropriate therapies for each of those bins or categories. Um, but we have a lot more choices now, um, and so that gets a lot trickier. And, and the real question is, how much data do you need before you pull the trigger and say, this is the right therapy? Mm -hmm. And actually, the answer today, I think, is you need a lot more therapy than you used to because you have more options. Mm -hmm. When it used to be that if you were fit, you got seven and three, and if you were unfit, you got a uh, hypomethylating agent or low-dose RSC, that was easy. We didn't need to wait for anything to come back. You could tell when the patient walked in the room and by interviewing them. Now we actually need tests back. So for example, for uh, Vixios, which is a drug that has a proven benefit in patients with therapy-related leukemia, you can get that off history. But it also has a, a proven survival benefit in patients with certain karyotypes. So maybe you need to wait for a, some karyotypic data back. We need flow data to know that myelotarg is effective, but we also know that myelotarg is not an effective treatment for patients with high-risk karyotypes, so you wanna have both of those. Mm -hmm. And of course, I mentioned the FLT3 inhibitors, which are effective in patients with FLT3 mutations, but we don't really know what they do in patients who don't have those mutations, they don't have a proven benefit, so you wanna have those data. Um, it's gotten a lot more challenging, and, and really what we've, we've done is we started to come up with a frontline kind of shotgun approach to sending off a bunch of tests that will be actionable. We want to know if the patients have a core binding factor mutation, which would predict response to myelotarc. We want to know whether they have a FLT3 mutation. We will ultimately want to know if they have an IDH mutation, though we're not using those drugs frontline. And we want to send all of the next-gen sequencing so that later on we have enough information to do risk stratification. Um, but right now, it's, it's probably going to take several days after seeing a patient who's stable to say, I have enough information to say, here's your best therapy. And that's primarily for older patients where we know waiting a few days probably is not gonna impact their outcome. And younger patients, we don't know that we wanna wait on them because they can get sick quickly and we wanna treat them as aggressively as possible. And there are some data that even say that that might be deleterious to wait too long. So it gets a little bit tricky. I think in my practice, uh, I wanna at least get a, a small amount of genetic data before I, I say what to, to treat patients with. So I'll, uh, quickly, and I think I know the answer, but the question came in, in myeloma, we have so many active drugs, um, and it seems like when we combine them in the upfront setting, the toxicities are not overwhelming, 
should we use, be using all of the best drugs up front? Should we be saving them? Should we use two drugs first and then three drugs later? Should we be moving to three and four drugs early and then use what we haven't later? What's your kind of sense of where that's going? And I know it's an abstract question at this point probably. Well, if you look at the data, I think the field uh, has come to a point, if you look in the relapse setting, for example, mm -hmm. Where all the trials that have been published the past 12 to 24 months show that three drug combinations are superior to two drug. Mm -hmm. So we have already done that for a long time in, mm -hmm. in, in upfront treatment. Now mm -hmm. the question is on the table, would you benefit from adding a fourth drug to, to for example, an imid prodrosome inhibitor dexamethasone combination? Would you, would you, uh, should you benefit, would you benefit from adding a monoclonal antibody to that? Mm -hmm. So those studies are, are in the works right now. There are multiple of those studies looking at different combinations. So uh, I think the proof will be obviously in the pudding. We will have to see if that extra fourth drug really will deliver deeper responses that are, uh, are sustainable. So that data is not yet there, but uh, mm -hmm. the field is moving very fast in that direction. I think with so many drugs available and with the opportunity to monitor deep responses, I think we have, we have kind of passed the old kind of point when we used to hold all the, the drugs or the few drugs we had back and do one at a time. So we, we can give a lot of very good drugs up front and if the disease comes back, we still have very many more to choose before. Mm -hmm. And even if the disease comes back again and again, usually it lasts for quite some time so you can go back and reuse the ones you use many lines back and it, it still can, can work. So I think that's, that's a new kind of direction on the field. So an, uh, the last question that I'm going to go around and just ask you all to give you each kind of one minute on your big other things that you want to, you think the audience should, should get a sense of. But first, Anasa, just one question that, that came in was about relapsed mantle cell lymphoma. And in a general sense, um, you know, patients had chemoimmunotherapy initially, they've relapsed. When are you using uh, ibrutinib? When are you using a calibrutinib now? What other things are you thinking about in those patients? Just in a nutshell, any, any big picture thoughts for the audience? So the, the example, if someone, let's say, had a mantle cell lymphoma treated with BR, for example, now progress to relax, what do, you, what do I do? I tend now to use uh, BTK inhibitors as second mm -hmm. line because the data suggests that the earlier the line you use, the better the, uh, the, the benefit. So I used to use a brutinib before, now we have a calbrutinib. Honestly, I haven't used it yet since mm -hmm. it's been approved. I'm looking forward to use it the first time around, but for now, I think a brutinib is as good as anything else. Okay. Great. So just one minute each, things that you think people need to know about. I'll start with you again, Anas, and we'll just go in the same order as we uh, covered the topics. So I think for lymphoma, I think the biggest things for us right now, uh, the CAR T cells, I think the field is uh, moving uh, so quickly, but there's a lot of excitement. We need a longer term follow-up to determine how this will fit in, in the uh, clinical practice of the average oncologist. And I think in ADCs, uh, beyond Hodgkin lymphoma, we haven't talked much about in, in non-Hodgkin lymphoma. I think it's, it's gaining traction. There's two an antibody drug conjugates for B-cell lymphomas. The polatuzumab looks very promising, and also another one's targeting CD19, actually a couple of them targeting CD19 with different payloads that also looks promising. So we need to keep an eye on those. Great. Tasha? I, I think 2017 was a fantastic year for drug development in acute leukemias, whether it was the four new drugs in AML, which is unprecedented, or the development of CAR T cells in ALL. It's just been a really exciting time. Um, so obviously people are paying a lot of attention to CAR T cells for ALL. Um, I, I, I think it, it is still a, a process that needs to be done in centers that are quite experienced with this because of the uh, exceptional toxicities that can be seen, and that's really the way that these are being developed. Um, Immunotherapy is very interesting for AML, but I think it's still very early. And I think what we are finding is that there are actual mutations and really good drugs out there now, and we're likely to see more approvals in the next year, too. So in the FLIP3 world, in the BCL2 world, in the IDH world, uh, there are likely going to be new drugs that probably move relatively soon. Okay, hold on. I think similar to the other uh, disease areas, CAR T cells are going to be interesting in myeloma to see where we're landing, uh, which of these different CAR T cells are actually going to be the winners, how will mm -hmm. they improve. We would need to see larger numbers, longer follow-up, and in different ways how to use them. We didn't talk so much about uh, the various monoclonal antibodies that are mm -hmm. in development. I think that is very interesting also in myeloma. Uh, we have the antibody conjugates. There are several bites in development also. Uh, that will also continue to be very interesting, and that will in some way maybe compete with CAR T cells, or it will just be in addition to that, mm -hmm. because you could think of those drugs going in combinations with all the other already established drugs. Mm 
So that will be super interesting to see uh, where we are going to land. And I also think that with more sophisticated MOD tools being developed, becoming available, that will also kind of clean up the field. We will learn better how to use the drugs. Could we even think of these tests to, to guide therapy and do things like that? Those, that's going to be very important. Yeah. And I'll just highlight, I think the area of circulating tumor DNA and minimal residual disease, but, it, but in particular, there's almost, I think, in lymphoma, a whole session at ASH, mm -hmm. oral session on variations of circulating tumor DNA, and we now can do methylation profiling on blood samples. This is going to potentially change uh, a lot about can we get things from the blood. This parallels what's happening in solid tumors. And if we can turn that into actionable information, as we talked about earlier, that we can actually use to treat a patient better, I think it could be very exciting for, and useful for patients over time, but still a lot of work to do. So this, I want to thank all of you. This has been a really great discussion. I've learned a lot. Uh, I hope that uh, you've found this information to be very valuable to your practice, that you're looking forward to uh, delving into more details of these abstracts, a lot of exciting things happening. Uh, we hope that this program has been helpful to you. We welcome the, your feedback on this and what we talked about today. And we'd be very happy if you'd send us any suggestions you have uh, regarding this program to improve uh, future, future projects like this to oncolivenn at oncolive.com. Thank you all very much for joining us today and watching the Oncolive News Network.